Okay, so last time we talked about how scientists look farther and farther out into the universe. And this time um, we'll be looking at the smallest particles. So rather than build telescopes to look farther out into space, uh, particle physicists built instruments to detect the smallest particles of matter. And actually, I think these are the lar largest scientific instruments in the world. For example, the Large Hadron Collider in Europe, which is a super collider, is 27 kilometers in circumference. And so they accelerate um, atoms or particles towards each other and collide them. And um, because of the title, we are made of star stuff. Uh, I'm gonna focus in this introduction on the matter part of the chapter. However, um, as Don Lincoln describes in this video, which is also in the chapter online, uh, matter really is energy. So it, I suppose that it does not matter. So we are made of star stuff is a famous quote by Carl Sagan. And you might not have heard of him, but he was the 20th century version of Neil deGrasse Tyson. He was extremely influential in the 1970s to 1990s. And he, um, he actually was most famous for his TV series that he produced called Cosmos, same as the modern Cosmos, I think by Neil deGrasse Tyson, same name. But if you ask people my age who their hero is, many will go ahead and ask people my age, who's your hero? Uh, some of them are going to say Carl Sagan. You know, they grew up with listening to Carl Sagan. And uh, I've actually listened to two relatives my age talk about how Carl Sagan's their hero. You know, they're like 65 now or something. So, um, oh, and I didn't say um, the quote, we are made of star stuff is from Carl Sagan. That's why I mentioned him. That was one of his most famous quotes from the um, 1970s. And he was um, very interested in finding extra extraterrestrials also. And he thought that because we're made of star stuff, all the other um, planets would have intelligent beings because they're also made of star stuff. Okay. So this uh, chapter begins with a short review of the history of theories of matter and energy. Um, and then we'll look at the discovery of the destruction of the structure of the atom and the development of the atomic bomb in World War II. And then in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, section 2-5, um, scientists discovered the standard model of particle physics. And they first um, understood the theory, but then they confirmed it with super colliders by observing the particles came off the, they're coming off the collisions in the super colliders. And then we'll look at uh, matter formation in the Big Bang, which was just the first few minutes of the universe. And then we'll look at element formation in stars and molecule formation in uh, molecular clouds. So in the fifth century BC, Leucippus and Democritus claimed that matter was eternal and was composed of atoms that moved randomly in response to natural forces. They did not believe in the existence of God. And Aristotle came along after them and said that, um, he criticized them because they were atheists and argued that God or gods um, created matter and gave it a purpose and a destiny. And Aristotle thought that matter strived towards its destiny, which is a philosophy called, called teleology. And his famous statement was, nature does nothing in vain. Of course, as always, Aristotle won the argument and Europe did not believe in atoms for the next 2000 years. So in the 17th century, uh, people still believe that atomism and atheism were bad and were linked. And um, this is Pierre Gassendi. He's, he's probably my hero. <laughs> but he lived at the time of Galileo and supported him in his viewpoint on the Copernican model of the solar system. However, unlike Galileo, he did not say, say things that offended the church hierarchy. He was like the ultimate insider. 
Um, so he was a philosopher and scientist and he wrote extensively on these and other topics. And um, the Stanford um, Encyclopedia of Philosophy um, describes him if you're interested in, in looking that up. But one of his famous statements was, um, God made atoms in the beginning and endowed them with a certain impetus that compelled them to move until the end of time. So he gave a framework which the Catholic Church or people in general could accept the theory of atomism and he divorced it from atheism. Um, not that that's necessary, but at that time that was necessary to have atomism accepted. So um, Robert Boyle was another influential person in this time period, in the 17th century. And um, unlike um, Gassendi, who was a priest, a Catholic priest, Boyle was a Protestant, although he never married. So in a way he was like a priest, but he went on a tour of Europe and he visited Gassendi uh, among others. And you might say that he followed in the footsteps of Gassendi and promoted similar ideals. Um, he wrote extensively on the topic of natural causes and how that viewpoint could be integrated into a theological framework. And similar to Gassendi, he argued that God set up the world to operate by natural forces. Um, he was a great scientist also. He made many discoveries, conducted many experiments, and if you're interested, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy also discusses his contributions. So um, by the end of the 19th century, uh, scientists had conducted many experiments in chemistry and they had identified many compounds, reactions and elements. And one of the most famous statements of the time was by the, the great experimentalist, John Dalton um, he said, we might as well attempt to introduce a new planet into the solar system or uh, to annihilate one already in existence as to, as to create or destroy a particle of hydrogen. So they thought the atom was indivisible. You know, they thought it, there was just like little round balls that um, could not be divided. But at the end of the 19th century and during the early 20th century, um, scientists discovered that atoms um, were composed of electrons in a nucleus. And they discovered uh, many of the amazing facts about atoms. Uh, they're, they're governed by extremely complex, but elegant wave equations and quantum mechanics principles. And that explained why um, chemicals react in the way that they do. Um, it, it explains the behavior of reactions, why certain atoms react with other atoms, and so on. And during that time, um, scientists also learned about the energy in an atom and, <clears throat> unfortunately, how to release it. So, unfortunately, people um, also figured out how to make nuclear weapons in the first half of the 20th century. And um, with respect to some of the things we've been talking about, one might say that nuclear weapons are not optimal for life. And skeptics argue that the universe is not fine-tuned for life by an intelligent being. They say if it were, then there would be no possibility of nuclear bombs. And I don't know whether it would be possible not to have the potential for nuclear weapons. And as we'll, you'll see in this chapter, um, atoms become more unstable as they become larger. And there is enormous energy, obviously, in atoms, E equals mc squared. So um, possibly um, intelligent beings, if you want to call them that, would always figure out a way to draw out the energy of the atom and destroy themselves. OK. So in the last half of the 20th century, scientists began to develop the standard model of particle physics. Uh, they already knew about electrons, but then they discovered that protons and neutrons each have three quarks, which are in the upper two rows here. So these are quarks. There's uh, very strange names for them, one of them being strange. 
but there's up quarks, down quarks, strong quarks, strange quarks, top quarks, bottom quarks. Um, I think the wrong guy discovered quarks, you know, it seems like somebody else could have come up with some better names. And you might be interested to know that quarks move inside protons and neutrons at one third the speed of light. So protons and neutrons are each composed of three quarks. Protons are two up quarks and down quark. Neutrons are two down quarks and an up quark. And inside of those protons and neutrons, which as you know, are the nucleus of the atom, the quarks are moving at one third the speed of light. You would think that quarks would move slower than electrons because electrons are in clouds around the nucleus, but electrons only move at 1% of the speed of light. But even that's amazing. You know, the inside these little atoms, you've got these things moving really fast. Um, and then here's some of the force particles and gluons are what keep quarks inside of protons and neutrons. They're kind of like rubber bands. The farther the um, quark gets away from the center of the proton or neutron, the stronger the force on it and it'll bring it back. And they can go way outside of the protons and neutrons. Um, and still be brought back by the gluons. And then the photon is the carrier of electromagnetic force. And, and then we have, other, we have the electrons, we have the neutrinos and Z bosons and W bosons. And then over here is the Higgs boson, which gives mass to all the other particles. So this is a picture of a super collider. You can see this little guy standing down here. Um, this is a detector inside of a super collider. And so what they do is they accelerate the particles towards each other, like maybe it's gold um, nuclei or something. And they crash them into each other. And then with these detectors, they observe all the particles coming off. And that enables them to validate the standard model of particle physics, how these how these collisions behave. And then um, scientists have figured out all the reactions between the different particles. For instance, the graviton reacts with all the other particles. Um, the Z boson reacts with all the other particles except the graviton and the photon. Uh, the W boson reacts with, looks like everything. I can't, it's not reacting with something I know. Probably the graviton. So anyway, scientists have figured out all these, the ways in which these particles interact with each other. And that's called the standard model of particle physics. So one of the most extreme examples of fine tuning in the universe, remember last time we talked about the expansion forces. Well, here's another um, extreme example. Um, it's the relative magnitudes of the forces at the atomic scale. So the electromagnetic force is one one hundredth of the strong force. The electromagnetic force is in the, um, is in the electron. The strong force is in the nucleus and holds the nucleus together. So if the electromagnetic force was large and the strong force was small, then atoms wouldn't be stable, but the strong force holds the nucleus together. Um, the most extreme example is the gravitational force is um, 10 to the 40th smaller. See, this is one over that. 10 to the 40th smaller than the strong force, you know, at the scale of the atom. And if it wasn't like this, for example, if the strong force was 50% larger um, or smaller, if it was 50% larger, all the neutrons and protons would have gathered together and formed one big lump. If it was 50% smaller, the atoms wouldn't hold together. So this is, this is um, like the one over the 120 orders of magnitude drop of the um, dark energy after inflation. This is a similar, precision of fine tuning that's used in, um, you know, it's, it's a very important argument for, for um, fine tuning and whatever you wanna say it's caused by, it's, it's one of the most dramatic examples. And section 2-5 also describes several, several more of these ratios and so on. 
Okay, let's move on to um, origin of matter in the universe. So section 2-6 describes the formation of matter in the Big Bang. And um, the most significant changes in matter in the entire 14 billion year history of the universe took place in the first microsecond, or maybe even less than that. Microsecond would be 10 to the negative six seconds. So the first known matter was photons. So here we have um, photons, these little guys, and they combined and formed um, gluons, quarks, and electrons at one nanosecond, okay? So the photons bounced off each other, formed quarks, gluons, and so on. And then um, that was the state of matter until like 10 to the negative six seconds. Um, so this was the quark gluon plasma. So although the sequence of early matter formation after photons has been validated with super collider studies, um, the origin of matter and dark matter is unknown. And the theoretical problem in physics is that all the matter and antimatter should have destroyed each other and there shouldn't be anything left. There shouldn't be an excess of matter left over to populate the universe, but there is. And this is from a recent paper that describes the problem. The understanding of the physical processes that led to the origin of matter in the early universe, creating both an excess of matter over antimatter and dark matter abundance that survived until the presence is one of the most fascinating challenges in modern science. And then they went on to say, the problem cannot be addressed within our current description of fundamental physics. So they've tried various ideas like supersymmetry, but they've disproven that with the um, super colliders. So now they're into some other theories like leptogenesis and the Higgs particle not being there and things not having mass. So they're, um, it's pretty interesting, but I, there's a few videos I think in the section 2-5 that describe what they're working on. Um, one of the most amazing examples of collaboration in the history of science is between the cosmologists and the particle physicists. So the cosmologists, you know, that's the whole universe, they're operating at the largest scale and the particle physicists are operating at the smallest scale. And so what the cosmologists have done is they've plotted the temperature of the universe over time. And what the particle physicists have done is they've figured out which particles are stable at which temperatures. So that's how they can say, okay, at this point, 10 to the negative 10 seconds, we had quarks, gluons, and then here at between 10 to the negative fifth and 10 to the negative second, negative two, or one over 100,000 and one over 100 seconds, we have um, protons and neutrons with quarks inside of them. So um, anyway, they have to, although they don't know how matter formed, once they had photons, they know how the transformations took place over time. And this is called the Hadron era, where the quarks and gluons, remember gluons are what hold the quarks together inside the protons and neutrons. The quarks and gluons, it was cool enough so that the quarks and, glu and gluons could come together and form protons and neutrons. So that, and those are called hadrons. So this is between uh, one over 100,000 seconds and one over 100 seconds. And then in the next few minutes of the universe, there was um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis in which about half of the, so this is a hydrogen nucleus. This is the electron going around it. And so we're just talking about nuclei here. There was no atoms so that it was too hot for the electrons to attach to the protons. But in the first few minutes, about half the protons combined and with neutrons and formed helium atoms. If it, if that hadn't happened, there wouldn't be any neutrons in the universe because the neutrons decay to protons. And then after about 300,000 years, the, it was cool enough for the electrons to attach to the protons and neutrons. So then we had atoms after 300,000 years. Okay, let's move on to section 2-7. 
And that describes the fusion processes in stars. And it's called stellar nucleosynthesis. So that's different than Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And the interior of stars is the perfect furnace to form the heavier elements of the universe. So there's extremely high density, about a thousand times higher than particles on Earth. And the temperature is 14 million degrees Kelvin. And that's hot, in, and the pressure is 1 billion times higher than atmospheric pressure. So you have that high pressure, temperature, and density. That's high enough pressure and temperature and density to force protons together. The thing that resists them being forced together is they both have a plus charge. Uh, you know, so the electromagnetic force is going to push them apart. But if you have a high enough pressure, temperature, and density, then you then you can force them together and form um, helium. But then after helium forms, um, carbon forms, and then neon, oxygen, silicon, and then finally iron. So what happens is um, the reason the sun stays expanded and doesn't collapse on itself is that there's all this energy pushing out from the inside. Well, once iron forms, you can't fuse iron together. It's just too big. And so once iron forms in the core, there's no more energy pushing out and the whole star just collapses on itself and forms a supernova. Uh, we didn't, our sun won't do that because our sun's too small to form iron. But this is what happens with the largest stars. After a few million years, they burnt themselves up, kind of like a hot fire with a lot of wood burns up faster than a small fire. Well, a hot star with a huge amount of you know, hydrogen and pressure burns up much faster than a small star, and then it forms a supernova. And that's what formed the heaviest elements and dust from which our planet was constructed. So up to iron was formed in stars, large stars. Our sun forms, I think, up to carbon or carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. But the largest stars formed all these elements, and then the supernova formed the, the even larger elements like gold. Um, one of the essential heavier elements that formed in supernova is uranium, as well as other radioactive elements. And those were incorporated into our planet as well. And those melt the core of the Earth due to uh, radioactivity and enable plate tectonics, which is necessary for life. Okay, so the solar system was born in a cluster of stars. They know that because there's evidence of supernova um, having exploded just before the formation of the solar system, evidence of that is in meteorites. And um, so these nearby supernova and large stars added metals to the dark molecular cloud in which our um, solar system formed. And uh, metals in astronomy are anything heavier than helium. Okay, that's, it's not a real metal, but that's just what astronomers say. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, and all the heavier elements from the largest stars and supernova were, were added to the molecular cloud in which our sun and solar system form. Now, you've probably seen this picture. This is called the Pillars of Creation. And um, it's a Hubble image, I think. But in this um, molecular cloud section, this is about five light years long. Um, it's inside of the Eagle Nebula, which you might have also heard of, which is a very beautiful um, stellar nursery in space. And so what happens is the largest stars form first, and then other sections of the cloud don't collapse immediately. So our sun might have been in a cloud like this that hadn't already collapsed, but you can see that the radiation from the larger stars is impacting the edge of the cloud. Um, and so but you can also see that there's small stars forming on the inside. So those are these red dots. But anyway, the nearby stars had already enriched the cloud with these heavier elements, which was really a key to our planet um, having life. And so once the dark molecular cloud forms, um, the dust on the outside of the cloud protects the interior of the cloud from interstellar radiation, which is very high energy and which breaks apart any molecules. 
And that allowed water and organic molecules to form undisturbed on dust grains. So the dust grains were from the supernova, they're in the cloud, and then water and organic ices, water ice and organic ices form on the dust grains. And before the cloud collapsed and formed our solar system, 50% um, of the solids in the cloud were water, water ice, 25% was organic ices, I might be a little bit off on this, and 25% was dust grains. And dust grains would be the solid part of the earth, what formed the solid part of the earth. So um, in Sagan's quote, we are made of star stuff, <clears throat> it might be a little more, because he used the word we, which is you know people, not planets. Um, it might be a little more accurate to say that we are made of dark molecular cloud stuff because 97% of humans is water and organic molecules. And so that all formed inside the dark molecular cloud prior to the collapse and formation of the solar system. All right, so um, in the chapter, there's a little bit of discussion of fine tuning. And I, I picked two videos where the people um, are not necessarily supporting any one perspective. So the first one, um, the guy goes and interviews different people, some with a creationist viewpoint or theistic viewpoint, some with a non-theistic viewpoint, um, discussing um, what was the cause of fine tuning. So that's this video. And then this is another video by Don Lincoln where he's discussing the fine tuning of the universe and he's a physicist from the Department of Energy. It does a lot of these like leptogenesis, matter formation experiments, whatever. And um, he states that God is one answer, but that's not a satisfying answer to him. He would rather find a natural answer. Okay, let's go back to Carl Sagan. Um, so Carl Sagan believed in a scientifically based belief system. And he thought that he had disproven the validity of religion. And this quote is from Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, Sagan expressed skepticism about, a convention, about conventional religion, which he wanted to, to replace with a scientifically based belief system. So you can imagine because he was so popular, he was a very controversial figure in the 20th century. And this kind of statement did not make theologians very happy. But um, from my perspective, if it's fair to use science to prove that religion is false, which he did, um, it's also fair to use science to prove that religion is true. I mean, to take the opposite approach. So um, why not test the creation account of Moses with scientific data and see if it's true? So this is the second verse in Moses' creation account. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. I've kind of rearranged it in this picture, where this is characteristics of a dark molecular cloud. Uh, formless and void earth, particles of dust in a cloud, dark surface, dark surface, deep, light years in diameter, and waters, half of solids or water ice. So, um, so I think that the second verse fits a dark molecular cloud pretty well. And um, the first verse was in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word beginning can mean a period of time, not just a point in time. So it could refer to the 9 billion years prior to the dark molecular cloud. So I'll just leave you with that.